For those of you guys that I have not yet met, my name is Jeremy Jones, and a couple weeks ago, I came on board here as part of the Soma City staff team. Yeah, oh, thanks. Oh, I love that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Now, usually when I first have a conversation with somebody here, they ask me, okay, yo, where, where are you from? And I say, well, we moved here from San Diego. And the first question after that is that, why? And so normally, and I, I, some of you guys got to hear me say this a few weeks ago, but normally the way I approach that conversation is if it's like, if, you know, if it's just a real quick conversation, I'll make a joke about, you know, hey, in San Diego, the, the beaches are free, the weather is free, but nothing else is. And, you know, like, aha, they'll laugh a little bit. And, you know, and if the conversation goes for a couple more minutes, they'll be like, okay, but, you know, tell me more. And I'll be like, well, originally I'm from Indiana and in California, they don't get Big Ten sports and they don't understand that. And so, like, I, I just wanted to go back to a place, you know, where, where when I cheer for IU, people know what they're talking. I know some of you guys are Michigan fans and some of you are Ohio State fans, but, but in reality, the best basketball school has always been IU and always will be. And so, well, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll make that conversation. And, and, and then if the conversation keeps going, people say, like, okay, no, but for real, like, why all the way from San Diego to Toledo? And, you know, there's a lot of churches in between San Diego and Toledo. What, what, what drew you to Soma City? And I'll say, well, it's, it's one thing, and you guys might have heard this before, and it's this. It says, Soma City exists to take the good news to those who are far from Jesus by pursuing meaningful, no-string-attached friendships with those close to us. Our goal is to be the most barbecue-grilling, storytelling, fence-hopping, meal-sharing, risk-taking, community-dreaming, injustice-fighting, Party throwing, story celebrating, friends in our neighborhoods and networks. Simply put, our vision is to be the best friend our city has ever known. Guys, I can promise you this is rare. I can promise you that this does not exist very often in very many places. And so when I was looking for a place and I found Soma City and I saw what this was about and I talked to Sammy and I talked to some of you guys and I was like, you guys actually believe this. You do not understand how rare this is. There's a guy named Ed Stetzer who does a lot of work in churches across the world and in America. He does a lot of research. This is something he said a few years ago. He said, finding a church that preaches the Bible, has good worship, and offers excellent child care can be easier than finding a church where we can make genuine, lasting friendships. There's one reason why genuine friendships are becoming rare, and thus of, that's one reason why genuine friendships are becoming rare, and thus of greater perceived value than any other aspect of modern church life. It is hard to find friends. It is really hard to find people that are going to be in your corner and care for you. It is hard to do it in church world. It is even harder to do it outside of church world. This is not just a church issue. This is a people issue. I mean, if you've been alive for the last three or four years, you understand this. The world is not becoming a friendlier place. You know, I mean, I don't know, I don't know if you noticed, like, the last four years of how we started interacting with each other, but it did not get nicer, okay? It did not get easier, in fact, you know, at some point, you were either labeled essential or non-essential during the recent pandemic. If you were labeled non-essential, you're like, so I get to stay home, but I'm not that important, okay? And if you were labeled essential, everyone yelled at you all the time, okay? You were told, like, you need to be doing your job better, faster, quicker, stronger, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we did not get friendlier. And this is actually a really big deal. It's not just to be, like, when we say we want to be the best friend our city has ever known, that's not just, like, a cool thing to do. It's not just like, oh, yeah, that sounds, you know, we've got to do something, you know. There are actual real-world implications to this. In the book, The Art of Neighboring, um, there was a group of pastors in the Denver area that, you know, that, you know, they had, like, one of those monthly pastors luncheons where they got together, and they started saying, you know, okay, how can we best serve our city? How can we best help our city? And so they met with the mayor of their city and just said, hey, how can we best serve you? How can we best make our city a better place? And this is what the mayor, a guy named Bob Fry, told them. He said, the majority of the issues that our community is facing would be eliminated or drastically reduced if we could just figure out a way to become a community of great neighbors. 
And he's talking about real things, homelessness, addiction, all kinds of things that we're, we're, the world is facing could actually be greatly reduced if we simply became good neighbors. Why? Because when you know someone's name, it's no longer just an issue, it's a person. And when it's a person, you step in at the early stages when it can still be done versus the latter stages when the problem is much worse. As we become good friends, we're actually making our city a better place. This isn't, like I said, just something nice. This is something necessary. In fact, if you think about it, isn't this kind of basically like Jesus 101? I mean, when, you, when, when, when someone said, hey, like, well, oh, here's an interesting thing. A lot of times when someone would ask Jesus a, a, a direct question in the scriptures, he rarely gave them a straight answer. He would give them like a, a story or something like that. But there's a few exceptions where when someone point blank asked Jesus a question, he straight up gave an answer back. This is one of them. In Matthew 22, it says, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, straight up answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. We get this as like, hey, this is the baseline. This is what we do. Like, if something's going to define you as a Jesus follower, it is your love for your neighbors. It is your love for one another. This isn't like graduate school. This isn't even undergrad. This is like middle school, high school. This is elementary. This is the baseline of who we are and what we do. We love our neighbors. That is the defining characteristic of who we are. So my question is, why is this so hard? Like, if this is just supposed to be the basic, why is this so hard? Why is it that not only does this, is this hard in the church, why is this hard in the whole world? I don't know uh, if you saw this, but I think four or five years ago in England, they appointed as a senior level government position a secretary of loneliness. Their loneliness is so rampant in England that they're like, hey, we got to tackle this as a government because it's wreaking havoc on our population. The whole world knows it. Like, very rarely does the church world and the whole world overlap and agree on something where we're all like, mm -hmm, yep, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And the solution we both agree on. So if we all agree that friendship is so important, if we all agree that this is so vital, what makes it so hard? And I think what makes it so hard is that we don't honestly know how to answer this question. I am loved because I what? What would you put in the blank? I am loved because I am a good father. I am loved because I'm really good at my job. I am loved. Like when you first heard that, I am loved because I, what did your mind immediately start to put into the blank? Because whatever it is that you put in that blank is probably what's keeping you from being a good neighbor. You're like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Okay. Here's the truth. I am loved because I exist. The truth of the matter is I don't have to do anything to earn love. I don't have to deserve love. I don't have to work really hard for love. I am loved simply because I exist. God loves you simply because you exist. Now, the reality is, most of us know that. But we know it the same way that I know how to find Kroger right now. And here's what I mean by that. I've lived, I've lived here for a couple weeks. I know Kroger exists. You don't need to convince me of that. I know that eating food is important. I don't need a sermon on why you should eat food. In fact, if you look at me, you know I, I like food. I know that there's ways to get to Kroger. My problem is, is I need a GPS every single time, and I, and I, I, who, if you've ever fallen behind me recently, I apologize, because like, I'm following the GPS, and it says, turn left here, and I'm like, here? No, 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 here? No, and so I know that Kroger exists. You don't, like I said, you don't have to tell me all about Kroger and the benefits of food and stuff like that. I just don't know how to get there very well, and I think for a lot of us, if I say, hey, did you know God loves you? We'd be like, yeah, absolutely, I know God loves you. Is that how you operate and live your life? Mm, maybe. I, I kind of know it. Like, I know it here in the theater, but do you know it on Monday? Do you know it on Tuesday? Do you know it throughout the week? Because here's what I know. The whole world is telling you something to fill in that gap. I am loved because I blank. And, and the more you hear a message of something else, the more you're going to believe 
that you've got to do something to earn love. And the more that you believe you've got to earn love, the busier you're going to make yourself. And the busier you make yourself, the less time you are going to have to be a good neighbor. See, we, we, like, we, we think for some reason that we are busier now than in times past. And I got to tell you, like, there's probably a little bit of truth to that. But honestly, like, we're not hunter-gatherers, okay? We're not spending the vast majority of our day trying to find enough food just merely to survive. People have always been busy. The problem that we have is our busyness is internally driven. Because we're like, if I don't do enough, I'm not good enough. If I don't make, you know, if my kids aren't the single best dressed and looking kids at school, I have failed as a parent. If my kids don't have great grades, I have failed as a parent. If I don't meet my quota for this quarter, I have failed as an employee. And so I keep driving myself, I keep driving myself. And when you're constantly feeling like you're not enough, you have nothing to give someone else. And so even though, like, my neighbors are all around me, I don't feel like I've got time to interact with them because I feel like a failure. I feel like, what am I going to possibly talk to them about? And honestly, I don't have time to talk to them because I've got to keep making sure that I'm good, that I'm good enough. And so if, if you're anything like me and you see a problem that the whole world has and you see a problem that most church people have, I kind of like to start reverse engineering Okay, I'm like, okay, so if this is the problem, we all agree it's a problem. Like, okay, well, then how do we fix this? Because we all agree that this is a real issue. We all agree that this is a real problem. And so what I kind of want to do for the, our time here today is just kind of give you a couple of things that will help break the habit. And so if um, there's a couple of scriptures I want to ground us in and then a couple actual practical practices. The first scripture I want to ground us in it's 1 John 3.1. It says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Our first identity is simply just that. We are a child of God. My children do not have to earn my love. My children cannot disearn my love. My children do not get loved more when they have, when they have cleaned the house well. Okay? I might appreciate it, but it doesn't make me love them more. Okay? A good day does not make me love my kids. A bad day does not make me stop loving my kids. In the same way, God loves us. Our identity, first and foremost, is a child of God. Children do not earn love. You do not have to earn love. It is just simply who you are. The second scripture I want to kind of ground us in is in John chapter 15. And this is Jesus having a conversation with his disciples the day before he goes to be executed. So he's sharing things that he thinks are vitally important for his disciples to know. Like, it's the last conversation. It's like, hey, you've got to understand this. You've got to remember this. And in John 15, this is what Jesus tells them. He says, abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. All right, let's just kind of break that down. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And the first response is, yes, I can. There's plenty of stuff I can do. Like, Jesus, are you saying I literally can't do anything? No, yeah, you can continue to feel insecure you can continue to go to your job and feel like you're not productive enough. You can, you can continue to do all the things that all the lonely people and all the stressed out people and all the angry people do. Yeah, you can keep doing that. But if you really want to find the life that Jesus promised, you have to abide by him. You have to stay rooted in him. Jesus says, you have to stay connected to me. And what we know is that the whole world is actively working to disconnect us. The whole world is actively working to disconnect us. Not in some sort of like sinister, you know, like I've got an eye patch and a scar and a plan to take over the world kind of way. In fact, that would actually almost be easier to resist because we're like, yeah, that's clearly evil. No, the problem is, is that every single day, you're going to get a thousand messages about what you really need in order to thrive in this life. 
You're going to get, I mean, they said um, a few years ago, and it's probably up since then, that the average person will be exposed to 5,000 advertisements or messages every single day. When you think about every single thing you see when you're scrolling through uh, Instagram, on Facebook, on television, on the radio, you know, as a magazine, the average person gets 5,000 messages per day. And that was, that was years ago, so it's probably up to since then. Of something you need, and here's the deal. No one's ever like, hey, I really want your money, so I'm going to make you feel bad, and if you give me your money, I'll give you this product. No, but they're like, hey, imagine yourself free at last. For four payments of $39.99, you can be free. You know, it, it, it appeals to the very things that we want. It appeals to who we are. It, it tells us that if we do that, and here's the deal. I'm not, I'm not anti-advertising. You know what I mean? People got to sell products. People got to eat. The problem I have is that so many of us are internalizing these messages over and over and over, and there's nothing that we're doing to combat it. And here's the deal. If you swim in water, you're going to get wet. We swim in a culture that tells us constantly you're not good enough. You're not good enough. And if we don't do anything about it, I don't care how strong you are, that will be the internalized message that you have. I don't know if you guys have seen this before or something like that, but they say the average high school student in America today has the same anxiety level as um, psychiatric patients in the 1950s. That's just what the normal student has. The average person, the average high school student today has the same level of anxiety as psychiatric patients in the 1950s. It's the culture we swim in. There's a saying that the system you have is perfectly designed to give you the results you're getting. That basically, we have created a culture, probably not intentionally, probably just piecemeal and accidentally, but we have created a culture that is so anti-you, that is so anti your peace, that the end result is what we see. Anger, loneliness, frustration, division, all of those things. And so if we're going to do anything about it, we've got to do what Jesus said, and we've got to abide. Now, I hear the word abide, and I'm like, I agree with that, but what does that mean? You know, like, stay rooted in Jesus. Absolutely. So what does that mean? You know, like, I don't I'm currently wearing flip. Oh, by the way, someone told me that the floors here at the theater were sticky. And you know what? You're absolutely right. I wear, I'm wearing flip-flops because I always do. And the number of times I've almost tripped this morning, like my feet get stuck into something. I'm like, okay, yeah. So you guys weren't lying. The floors are a little sticky, but we love Jesus. So when we talk about abiding, we're talking about that. How do I get stuck in something? How do I plant my feet in something? How do I dive deep into something so that Jesus is going up through me and out of me? So that when I'm getting battered by everything around me in culture, I'm so firmly planted in Jesus that I'm not trying to be good. Goodness is the result of what comes out of me as I stay in Jesus. And so I told you, I wanted to give you guys two practices. I wanted to give you some practical things that you can actually do so that we can be the best neighbor our city's ever known. The first one is simply this, Sabbath. What Sabbath is, it's breaking the pattern of lies. Sabbath is breaking the pattern of lies. I'm going to give you a scripture and I'm going to explain what I'm talking about here. As Moses was getting ready to send the people into the promised land, and he's trying to remind them of what's important, he tells them this in the book of Deuteronomy. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your sons or your daughter or your male and female slave or your, or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the resident alien in your towns so that the male, your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Let's, let's break that down. Let's talk about that. God is reminding them, Moses is reminding them in this situation, that you were once, talking to the Hebrew people, you were once defined by how productive you were. In Egypt, you were a slave, and you were told that your worth was based on how well you made bricks. And so as you go into a new land and you start a new land, you're going to take a day every single week where you are not productive and you remember that you are loved anyway. And not only that, you don't get to tell anybody else that's connected. I mean, he goes through a whole list. 
your ox, your donkey, if anyone's new in town, if, you, if there's anybody who's like your servant or anything, none of them get to skip out on Sabbath. Because the temptation will be one of two things. It'll be either to define yourself by how productive you are or to take Sabbath yourself and say, you know what, but I'm going to have Joe over here who works for me. Uh, he doesn't get a Sabbath because I still I want the extra. And the, the, the danger of not Sabbathing is you either work yourself to death or you make yourself a pharaoh. And you either start to oppress others or you start to be the oppressed. And so Sabbath is a way to break the cycle of your value is based on what you produce. See, Sabbath is not a reward for getting your work done. Sabbath is a reminder that the work is never done and you are loved anyway, okay? So, like, just think about this. Think about this. Your kids have never come up to you and said, Mom, Dad, all of my emotional needs have been met. Mom, Dad, I don't want any more snacks. I don't need you to take me anywhere. I want you to just simply rest in the goodness of God. No, your children have never said that to you. And here's the deal. If you start basing your worth on how good of a parent you are, there's always something more to do. I promise you, your boss has never come up to you and said, guys, we've made as much money as can possibly be made. There's not another sale to make. There's not another client to call. We have done it all. I want you to just take a day and do nothing at all because all work has been done. That has never happened, and it never will because there's always more to do. There's always more to get. And here's the deal. This gets internalized at a very young age. The other day, I took my son, who was four, to Barnes & Noble, and he talked me into buying him um, a Buzz Lightyear toy. So I get him the Buzz Lightyear toy. In the car, leaving the parking lot of Barnes & Noble, he looks at me and says, Dad, Buzz Lightyear needs some robots to fight. And then he says, hey, Dad, like 20 seconds later, Buzz Lightyear can't fly without his ship. We should go back in and get the robots and the ship. And like, buddy, I just gave you like a brand new toy and not even like, we can't even get home before the desire for more comes. It is ingrained in us. Sabbath is a deliberate breaking of that. I love what Wayne Muller in his book, Sabbath, says. I mean, just, he says this so much better than I can. He says, a successful life has become a violent enterprise. We make war on our own bodies, pushing them beyond their limits. War on our children because we cannot find enough time to be with them when they are hurt and afraid and need our company. War on our spirit because we are too preoccupied to listen to the quiet voices that seek to nourish and refresh us. War on our communities because we are fearfully protecting what we have and do not feel safe enough to be kind and generous. If more is what you're about, it is impossible to be a good neighbor. Because once you get more, you have to maintain more. Like, you don't, like, I, you know, I mean, we all know that that's a lie, like, that more will make us happy. Because as soon as you get it, you're like, well, what happens if it goes away? What if I lose it? You know, I'm not against anything. You know, you, you like a house, you like a car, whatever, that's fine, that's good. But if you think that's what's going to make you happy, it's always going to just make you empty and make you afraid that you're going to lose it. And so Sabbath, once again, is not a reward for your hard work. It is an acknowledgement that I am loved in spite of how much I've achieved or how little I've achieved. And so one of my encouragements to you is that every, like, you know, if you've never practiced this, if you've never started this, find a block of time, Friday night, Saturday morning, start there, and just simply do nothing. Nothing that you're tempted to define yourself by. So if you're tempted to define yourself by your work, do no work. If you're tempted to define yourself by how good of a parent you are, tell your kids that it's peanut butter and jelly and there's no laundry getting done. You know, like, do, not def do no work that you're scared or tempted to define yourself by and simply acknowledge the fact that I am loved, I am good. And someone always asks me, like, how do you do a Sabbath with children? Okay, if there are two parents in the house, here's what you do. You switch off. You got the kid for the morning. I got the kids for the afternoon. If there are not two parents in the home, you find someone within Soma City and say, hey, we're going to practice this together, okay? Sabbath was commanded by God. Okay, in the same list of rules that God gave us where he said, do not murder people, that's kind of important. Also, take a Sabbath. And in fact, he said take Sabbath before he said do not murder. You know why? Because if you don't rest, eventually you're going to murder somebody, okay? So take a Sabbath. This is a good thing. 
The second thing I want, the second practice I want to encourage you in is simply this. Praying scripture. I did not say reading scripture. I'm all for reading scripture. Read as much scripture as you want. Good stuff. Actually, I think Sammy the other day said, don't read as much scripture or something like that. I saw, I saw the video floating around. Now. But praying scripture. And here's what I mean by this. Scripture reconnects us to what is true. It reconnects us to what God has actually said about us. And as we pray scripture, we break the habit. We break the incoming lies that we get. In the same way that Sabbath is an entire 24-hour period of breaking lies, reading scripture reconnects us to what is actually true. Praying scripture renews our heart. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through one that I do all the time. This is a scripture that I walk through all the time to remind me of what is actually true. You'll probably find it very familiar. It starts off, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Now, if you're like me, I memorized it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And so like trying to do it in the new version, if I mess up, that's okay. But the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I need to pray that because the temptation will always believe that I do lack something, that there's something more I need. There's something more I've got to have in order for me to actually be whole and right. And when I pray that the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing, I'm reminded of what is true. And then he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. I'm not a shepherd, and so this was kind of a surprise to me when I found this out, but that line, he makes me lie down in green, in green pastures. If you're a sheep, you only lie down in green pastures after you've eaten your fill. As you walk through a green pasture, sheep naturally just keep eating and eating and eating, and when they are full, they will lie down. And so the promise of God is that we are full in him. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Where does my soul go to be refreshed? When I've been told I'm not good or I'm worthless or... I told you guys, I told you last week that I get emotional. So this is, you have to accept that. Um, whenever, whatever the lie is that you have been told, your soul finds refreshment in him. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, or if you're like me, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. There is an acknowledgement that life is hard, that you're going to go through things that you wish you wouldn't have. But God is with us even then. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. He goes on to say, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. We were doing a little staff uh, meeting the other week, and uh, Shannon brought out, she brought up when we were talking about this, that when you prepare a ta- when God prepares a table before you, the only person that has a seat at that table is you and God. And, you, and it is your choice whether or not you give the enemy a seat at that. And you don't have to. And I love that acknowledgement that, hey, like, God is preparing a table just for the two of us. Enemies don't, we're not invited. They don't get to crash the party. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. It's not just full. The goodness of God is so good that it overflows. What is the promise? Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My challenge to you is to, I mean, you don't have to pray this whole thing every day. A lot of times I simply pray, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. But every time you're tempted to feel like you're not enough, you're not good enough, that you need to be doing more, pray that back to God. Live in that. Because here's the deal. The challenge is to love your neighbor as yourself. And we can't give our neighbors what we do not have. We cannot give our neighbors love that we do not ourselves live in and experience. And there's a lot at stake. Not just for us, but for our neighbors. Let me remind you of that quote once again. The majority of the issues that our community is facing would be eliminated or drastically reduced if we could just figure out a way to become a community of great neighbors. Guys, this is what we've been called to. It's why I moved from San Diego to Toledo. I want to be a part of a community that is practicing this, that is doing this, that is seeing lives changed, not because of some great, amazing, like, spectacle that we put on, but because we walked across the street, we walked across the apartment building, we walked across the dorm room and became a friend to someone who needed a friend. So let us dwell deeply. Let us abide deeply in Jesus' love for us. 
And let's share that with those around us.